Media access to high-profile criminal cases, well, it's been a topic for decades. But cameras in the courtroom, they've seemed to have been shown the door more than usual lately. The Koberger case would be the second time in a year Idaho media has had to make a case to allow them. A law professor explains what that argument might be. I've never intimidated anybody. I speak about the facts of the case and mention people that might be potential witnesses, but I have never threatened them. But that is exactly why Ammon Bundy was in an Ada County courtroom today, to face charges he has intimidated and harassed witnesses. He hasn't been the only one allegedly doing such things either, and it hasn't just been witnesses facing such tactics. The Onion, I guess that's what they call it here in Meridian. Because the well above ground water tower looks a lot like an underground vegetable, and one that hasn't had a new skin of paint in more than two decades. Informing the public, letting the public know what happens in court, I think is a, is a healthy thing. I think the more attention, the better on the processes of the court system, because I think it helps debunk some myths about how we do our business. Okay, so that was almost a year ago when Ada County Judge Michael Oates told us why he would usually allow cameras in his courtroom. Back then, we were talking about cameras being allowed for the Lori Vallow Daybell murder trial. That judge, Judge Stephen Boyce, well, he ultimately said no, saying continued visual coverage would be a risk to fair administration of justice. Well, we're facing the same possibility 11 months later. Brian Koberger is the man charged with killing four University of Idaho students last year. This Friday, we expect a hearing to help the judge decide if cameras can capture Koberger's trial. Again, nearly a year ago, Judge Boyce used precedent to make his decision to ban them. A 1965 case known as Estes versus Texas. Taking a look at Koberger's motion to also keep cameras out of the courtroom, his lawyers cited the sa that same case and they referenced it 10 times throughout the seven page motion. So this seems like a good time to bring in Andrew Bartline to help explain kind of how we got to this point to push the cameras out of the courtroom and why this seems to be becoming more common. Andrew? Yeah, well, state law says a judge has the power to regulate cameras in their courtroom as they see fit. The state of Idaho judicial branch says the court must weigh constitutional factors with legal precedent, which can often look like a battle between free speech, freedom of the press, the First Amendment, which most people know, well, against the defendant's right to a fair trial. And it looks like the playbook is set in Idaho behind that 65 court case you brought up, Estes versus Texas. Now, quoting that direct in Koberger's motion, it says the chief function of our judicial machinery is to ascertain the truth. The use of television, however, cannot be said to contribute materially to this objective. Rather, its use amounts to the injection of an irrelevant factor into court proceedings. Pretty strong language there, but it's paraphrased very similarly by the judge in Vallow's trial where they say the scope of the coverage cannot supersede the rights of all parties to the fair administration of justice in this case. So that's sort of how that's paraphrased there. Well, Estes overturned a conviction in the 60s. That's why it's a big case that gets a lot of attention. And the judge said in that case, media turned a man's pretrial proceedings into a theater. Again, that's the judge's language from the 60s. Pretrial, a big part of it. Why? Well, the jury hasn't been selected yet. So in Koberger's motion, his lawyers say the media is breaking the rules clearly set by judge, by judge judge. The judge so far has said and warned cameras cannot focus only on the defendant. Estes recognizes this as a form of mental harassment. Again, language from that case in the 60s. And the motion leans into it, saying, quote, Mr. Koberger is entitled to defend himself against capital criminal charges without cameras focused on his fly. Again, a little cute with the language there. We've already heard the judge say the First Amendment is not absolute, again, with his warnings. We know multiple factors go into that decision and ask the law professor at the University of Idaho to explain that thought process and what it actually looks like. I think the issue with cameras and videotaping in a courtroom is not impeding access to courts necessarily. Courts are still open for the most part. There are certain proceedings that you won't be able to see. But the ones that you're able to by administrative rule, you can go in and watch them. You can get the transcripts or the audio recordings. Um, and so there's other ways to access court proceedings and still see those without having cameras in the courtroom. And some of the concerns may be witnesses might not want to come forward. Their testimony might be impeded if they know that cameras are on them. 
If it's individuals in the courtroom recording, maybe it ends up on social media, maybe it's clipped in a way that doesn't fairly and accurately represent what happened. The rule of law and what happens in proceedings is very important. I understand that it makes it a little more interesting if you can see the players and see how proceedings unfold, particularly in big cases where not everybody can get a seat in the courtroom. Not everybody has the ability to access a courthouse or a courtroom to see it, but um, there are other ways you can get that information court orders, transcripts, audio recordings, and then of course the job that reporters do in reporting on what happens in a courtroom. I will argue firsthand the job of reporters is a little more difficult to report what happens in that courtroom when you don't have a camera, especially through our media. But Professor Ball adds a single camera is often used as a compromise, a pool cam is what they call it, where one camera captures that scene, that footage is distributed to multiple outlets. We expect this motion asking to ban cameras from the courtroom to be addressed in a hearing this Friday. The judge will hear the defense's arguments, weigh those values Professor Ball explained, then make a decision. Or guess what, Brian? This won't shock you. Maybe he doesn't make a decision. Could be pushed on to a later date. This trial has had plenty of delays. For example, Kohlberger waived his right to a speedy trial. Also, that hearing Friday was supposed to include his grand jury indictment. There's a motion to dismiss that from the defense as well. Yeah. That's been pushed back a month, so we'll see where it goes. And just for full disclosure, KTVB is on the side of wanting to have a camera in the courtroom. Right. That's the side that we are going to be on with this hearing whenever it's held. Thank yes, you very sir. much, Andrew. This is a true infringement on the right to speak, the right to assemble, and the right to grieve government. And that is anti-government activist and former candidate for governor Ammon Bundy. It's, I think we need an acronym for that. Can't think of it. But anyway, that is Ammon Bundy describing his current legal situation with St. Luke's in, well, five seconds. However, what he's actually describing is what is guaranteed by the First Amendment and protects those rights of the people from being abridged by the government. And that's not what this actually is. This is or was a civil lawsuit about defamation, which St. Luke's won and was awarded $52.5 million by a jury. A civil court case which Bundy did not participate at all, which he also has the right to do. Well, today, a day after another no-show in Jim County for a separate lawsuit, Bundy was in court to face his civil contempt charge for violating a court order to stop the harassment and intimidation of witnesses involved in that earlier original lawsuit. An arrest warrant was issued back in April by District Judge Lynn Norton, which was finally served almost three weeks ago in Emmett. Well, today in front of Judge Nancy Baskin, Bundy refused to respond to any of the claims against him. He did, however, ask a lot of questions of the judge since he was there without an attorney to represent him. Bottom line, another court date has been set for October 2nd for a court trial concerning Bundy's contempt charge. But being down there today, we wanted to ask him about what was posted by his friends and colleagues with the People's Rights Network the far-right anti-government group started by Bundy. Last night, the group sent out a text message to its members, a call to action, they call it. We're gathering at Holland and Hart, that's the law firm representing St. Luke's, to protest the agency infringing their First Amendment right, which isn't a thing. Then at the Ada County Courthouse, they wanted everybody to show up and show support for Bundy. Then there was another message sent out last night, one that showed flyers with Judge Norton's picture on them. They plan to distribute these flyers in the judge's neighborhood. How do we know this? Well, because that message was accompanied by another message, another call to action for people to show up in the judge's neighborhood this evening from about now till about 6.30. That exact address will be provided later, they were called, or they were told. An event. They called this an event. An event allegedly planned or at least promoted by the same man who was arrested and found guilty of disturbing the peace outside an Ada County Commissioner's house in December of 2020. The man who supposedly, supposedly sent out those messages, he's one of these people. I think what Diana needs is a little more horn. So it was my 12-year-old and my 8-year-old um, huddled together in my son's room. You guys, sometimes I admit I feel a little bit aggressive and pissed off. Okay, so that's just a little sample of what lasted at least 15 minutes in front of Diana Lachiondo's house back in 2020. So does Bundy approve of this doxing and this kind of behavior in front of somebody's house, even if they are an elected official? I asked him that today after I showed him this flyer. Well, I, this is the first time I've ever seen it. I have no idea. This is the very first time I've ever seen it. That kind of stuff happens often. Well, that's their right, though. And then if they, if they, if to some... show up at, at a judge's house or a detective's house or yes, police absolutely, house. it is their right. It is a protected right as long as they don't go on their private property, as long as they don't threaten or intimidate them, 
They're officers of the government, and as long as they're on public property, they have a right to protest them. It's called grievance. And you don't have a problem with that? I, I don't have a problem with that. I think it needs to be done in a, you know, they cannot go on their property. They should not intimidate them. They should not threaten them. But they should absolutely know that the people are concerned. That's what's called grievance. At their house? Yeah, at their house. So he's okay with it. Bundy contends he's never intimidated anybody, as you heard. Never threatened anybody either, he says. He's merely mentioned people's names who might be potential witnesses. Well, a jury has already decided he has done those things and decided the damages for that. He and his People's Rights Network and his friend, Diego Rodriguez, what they did, the damage they did to the hospital and its staff, well, it amounted to $52.5 million. Last Friday, Judge Baskin issued a permanent injunction ordering Bundy and Rodriguez and the groups they represent to remove the defamatory statements from their websites related to St. Luke's and their employees. Anything referring to them as, quote, criminals or alleging abuse or kidnapping, that all has to be gone. And failure to do so, well, that could result in another contempt charge. Bundy's current contempt trial, scheduled for October 2nd, Bundy told us today, wasn't sure if he's going to hire an attorney or if he will even show up. You know what? It's election day for some of you, and we got stories about well, algae blooms and balloons about to bloom. Here's some other things. The 411 with Abby Davis. Don't forget, today is election day. Four school districts in five counties have either a bond or a levy on this year's ballot. In Canyon County, the Valley View School District is asking for a supplemental levy of $7 million per year for two years. In Jerome County, the Valley School District is also asking for a supplemental levy. The Shoshone School District has a special general obligation bond on the ballot. And lastly, the Castleford School District is asking for a supplemental levy of $350,000 per year for two years for a total of $700,000. Reminder, you can only vote if you live within the boundaries of the school district, not just the county. If you're not registered to vote, don't worry, you can register at the polls. Polls close tonight at 8. Need more information? Check out our voter guide right now at KT. TVB.com. Garden City has a new police chief. The mayor and city council members appointed Corey Stambaugh last night. Chief Stambaugh was previously a lieutenant as well as interim chief of police following the resignation of Chief Rick Allen. Allen retired on July 1st and was with the department for 30 years. We know it's Tuesday, arguably the worst day of the week. So why not start thinking about holiday weekend plans? Hitting the water this weekend? Be aware, South Central Public Health issued a public health advisory for Cedar Creek Reservoir, also called Roseworth Reservoir, southwest of Twin Falls. There are unhealthy amounts of cyanobacteria in the algae blooms, which are dangerous for people, pets, and livestock. So don't go into the water, and if your animals do, make sure to wash them off with clean water immediately and call your vet. And seriously, people, don't drink the water. Boiling it doesn't help. 
Other areas that have cyanobacterial blooms are Brownlee Reservoir, Fernand Lake, Hell's Canyon, and Salmon Falls Creek. So make sure you recreate responsibly. Speaking of Labor Day fun, the 32nd annual Spirit of Boise Balloon Classic takes to the skies this week. The event starts tomorrow with Kids Day, where kids can take a free ride, tethered to the ground of course. The festival goes through Sunday at Ann Morrison Park. Here's another fun way to spend Labor Day weekend, the Hermit Music Festival. The All Ages Festival is in its ninth year. There will be live music at Indian Creek Winery in Cuna, plus events going on in Boise, like dancing, kids crafts, movies, local food and drinks, and of course, music. It's from Thursday through Monday. For more information, check out hermitmusicfest.com. That's the 411 on the 208. I'm Abby Davis. If you live in Meridian, or anywhere around it, you can't miss it. Some even say it's a warm welcome home. Yeah, we're talking about the water tower. You ever wondered why it's yellow? Or why old timers call it the onion? We found out with a little help from a 21-year-old 208 redial. You have any old or quirky stories to share with us? Well, we'd love to hear about them. Or just your thoughts on today's show. Text them to us, 208-321-5614. Don't forget your name and the hashtag, the 208. Keep them short, keep them sweet, or sort of, and we might share yours at the end of the show. Well, it has been a bit of a wild afternoon weather-wise, especially in the Central Mountains. But look at our observed high temperatures today and take a good look at the 90s you see across the board for the Treasure and Magic Valleys as this may be the last time we see temperatures into the 90s for the entire 2023 summer season and into the end of the year. So looking outside right now, this is the view from Skycam 7. The foothills and the mountains, they're out there somewhere. But look at the smoke that has been dragged into southwest Idaho 
courtesy of that strong cold front that is marching across the gem state as we speak. Temperatures have dropped down to 90 in the city of trees. They will continue dropping tonight and wait until you see our highs for tomorrow. It'll feel like fall instead of late summer. Here are those wind speeds right now. It's been a windy, blustery, stormy afternoon in the mountains, mostly just windy and smoky in the lower elevations. And we do expect those blustery winds to continue throughout the evening. Here are those storms firing off right now. Again, almost all isolated in the central mountains, but we may see a stray storm or two popping up in the Treasure Valley before this is over and done with. Again, that cold front will move off in the next couple of hours, bringing much cooler air in behind it. But still, we do have extreme fire weather concerns out there. So all of the areas shaded here in hot pink are under a red flag or fire weather warning through 8 o'clock tonight. Look at our high temperatures for tomorrow. We were near 100 in Boise yesterday. We'll top off at 77 tomorrow with a breezy northwest wind. We do warm a bit for Thursday and Friday, but more storm chances come in for Labor Day weekend. 21 years ago this month, there was a mammoth project taking place in the city of Meridian. The city's most visible landmark was getting freshened up and up being the dominant word here since we're talking about the big old yellow colored water tower in town. And as John Miller found out, there's another name for that tower that is still being used today in today's 208 redial. <laughs> It's that piece of the Meridian skyline you have to get next to to fully appreciate. This thing is huge. I mean, how tall is it? Uh, to the top, it's uh, 135. 135 feet? 135 feet. 500,000 gallons. It is big. And Kurt Hicks' crew has the titanic task of painting this thing. The onion. I guess that's what they call it here in Meridian. The Meridian onion. The Meridian onion. Actually, I wondered if they were going to paint it yellow again. You see, Kurt paints these things every kind of color. Oh, some white, some reds, black, blue, whatever they want. Why do they want yellow? That's what I was wondering, but I don't know. It doesn't look too bad, does it? Not to Ryan Dooley. Yeah, I think it's nice. You are the manager here at Under the Onion. Under the Onion. <laughs> I never made the connection. Not many did. I had no idea. Neither did Rhonda Redfern, and she works there. I had customers say, where'd you get your name? I go, I don't know, let me go find out. Which is why it's very important that Meridian's onion stays yellow. We've got it all power washed. We're gonna go up and spot prime it with epoxy. Then while we all live under the onion, Kurt and the boys will spread 200 <laughs> gallons of paint over it. Don't miss any. I oh, will try not to. All right. And get the spelling right on Meridian. Yeah, because I don't want to see Meridan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or Hi Mom. It'd be probably better with the purple top since, you know, an onion bloom has a purple top well, on see, it. Well, see, now you're just getting picky. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is a little picky. Yeah. But anyway, it works, huh? Yeah. And everyone's really excited. <laughs> as excited as you can get about a water tower. Okay. John Miller, Idaho's News Channel 7. Okay, so watching that back, we had a few questions, more than a few. Fortunately, though, they weren't answered in Miller's, well, less than two minute story. Maybe you have some questions as well. For example, we get the onion reference because it kind of looks like that, right? But according to the city of Meridian, the water tower got the nickname because of its proximity to one of the city's well-known drive-in burger joints, the Hungry Onion. It's a place made even more famous by its inclusion in the Clint Eastwood movie Bronco Billy, filmed at various locations around the Treasure Valley in the fall of 1979. And the tower apparently looked like the onion logo of the restaurant. 1979 is important because the Hungry Onion and the under the onion, I should say, they no longer exist. But 1979 is important because the water tower was built just three years before they filmed Bronco Billy. And it stands officially at 138 feet. The color is officially called sunshine yellow, which apparently came without any thought put into it. So the question of why paint it yellow? Well, we're told it was a standard color offered by the company who made the 500,000 gallon tank because it doesn't fade quickly and it resists rust. So how good are those qualities? Well, the tower only has to be painted, we're told, every 30 years or so, meaning the last time it was freshened up was when John Miller did that story. Finally, any chance the next time they do, I don't know, freshen it up, they change the color or maybe change the boring block letters on it? No way, the city tells us. It's a staple of Meridian. Its presence holds tremendous meaning to longtime residents. It's kind of a symbol of home as they return from traveling.
All right, let's get to Randy here, who had something to say about our Bundy coverage, who refuses to use his name. Can I please stop giving that person coverage? You're feeding him exactly what he wants. Every top story is a badge of honor to him. This person is not newsworthy. I'll tell you why it is newsworthy. He's a former candidate for governor. 17% of voters in the state voted for him back in 2020. He's also an anti-government activist who's had several run-ins with the law in Eastern Oregon and in Nevada. So yes, he is a bit newsworthy. And again, got a big chunk of votes this last uh, gubernatorial election. So aiming and discharging a loud air gun at a citizen's house is not considered harassment. Isn't their intent that their intention? Asked Nancy, possibly, I guess. Those people that we showed video of, by the way, they were charged with disturbing the peace. A lot of people commenting why Bundy is not already in jail for his antics, as they put it. Well, this is a civil case. And you can't just arrest somebody for a civil case. And that's kind of the basis of all this is. He didn't have to show up for court for a civil case. He can just let things go and get the judgment against him like he did for that $52.5 million. Cameras in courtrooms are about ratings. Let's get back to good old-fashioned reporting, artist renderings, and reporter opinions as opposed to camera. Then he went on. I guess you don't want to use the phone to send us text messages anymore. That would be go back to the rotary phone as well. By the way, that court date already has been scheduled to September 22nd. Question about the water tower. Is it still being used as a water tower? Kathy wants to know. Yes, it is. We'll see you tomorrow.